Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha, and welcome back to another talk story with John Waihe'i. Our special guest this afternoon is Colin Moore. He is the director of the Public Policy Center at the University of Hawaii, which makes him, by the way, one of the most uh, knowledgeable, uh, uh, most knowledgeable people uh, uh, that may know something about the polit politics in Hawaii. Well, I don't know that about that compared to you, but I'm, no, I'll give no, my I'm, best I'm shot. serious <laughs> because, you know, people like myself just sort of um, go along, you know, like amateurs. <laughs> Here you are, you actually get data and look at it, look at trends and everything. So I thought it would be fun if we uh, kind of had fun this afternoon and talked about politics in Hawaii. And uh, actually the idea for this show um, occurred to me when I saw you uh, on the panel that, uh, that at the recently um, held super debate. That's right. Yeah, you, you had to sort of tie all of these things together. And I said, no, nah, we ought to have them on the show. You know, well, I'm happy to be here. So first of all, tell me what you do at the, as director of the uh, Public Policy Center at the University of Hawaii. What the, what's the focus, just so people will know? Sure, sure. So I mean, we're, we're expanding, but we've always been real involved in energy policy, um, designing the implementation of various social service programs, especially for children. Um, we're recently involved in some transit-oriented development projects, and we're starting a survey research center. So I hope that really will be a way to get independent, non-biased uh, survey research data um, about voters and citizens of the state. And with all that data, you need to work with uh, policymakers. So That's you, right. You, know, you have a real interest in uh, what happens in Hawaii with the with elected officials and the like? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, it's really important. <laughs> so tell me about the debate. First of all, did you like the the style of the super debate? I mean, having three different offices uh, up for debate. Yeah, it was. I mean, it allowed them to have it at this beautiful location, right? At, right. In Kamehameha Schools. Um, I think that it might have been a little exhausting for viewers. That was that was my concern. I mean, you set something like that up, you have to do them all in a row because you can't do it three times. But right. I think really when you're talking about a three-hour debate, you risk getting only the most interested people watching um, and everyone else starts to tune out. Has so. there been any feedback on that or whether more people, less people watch the format? I'm sure the TV station has some data. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe no. people tuned in for different things at different times. Oh, maybe times. somebody watched the, okay. But that's, that's the danger. Um, but go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you also got to put up with the weather. Yeah, <laughs> and it started raining pretty hard Yeah, there. you know, yeah, I yeah. actually felt sorry uh, for a candidate uh, for Congress. Yeah. Uh, 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 man, um, what do you say, congressperson, I guess. Yeah. Congress member. Yeah. Uh, Hanabusa, because she got caught out. She in the in the in the rain really got rained on. I don't think it was obvious to people watching at home, but it was raining pretty hard by the right. end. Right, and you know, I, I didn't think that that was a good thing. But yeah, it, I mean, the, you know, the interesting thing about the way those debates are set up, and and you've certainly participated in stuff like this, is that I mean, it was really this this kind of open style, right? I mean, there was. Um, Mahalani did ask questions, but it wasn't the traditional studio podium style. No. I mean, at least in the LG's debate, for example, you had to be pretty assertive and aggressive without, without looking like a jerk, and that's sort of a hard balance to, to, to well, pull Well, one off. of the things, one of the things, it's a very difficult debate. I mean, uh, running for, I, I was lieutenant governor. You know, and so when you're running yeah. for that office, you're answering questions about what am I going to do with the yeah. economy, how are you going to ch fix this, and what you're going to... And yet the only constitutional duty you have is to be ready to take over when the other guy dies. Right. You know, and so you can't really say, well, I'm here because I think, you know, maybe his time might be up when I'm in office. Right. You know? <laughs> exactly. So, so you, I felt sorry, actually, um, in some respects. For the candidates, but on the other hand, I thought uh, Mehalani did a good job because she really kept everything moving and focused and the like. I, th I think she did a great job. I mean, it's tough to it's tough to balance that, and I mean, everyone wants to speak and to keep them moving along with the questions. 
So I, I was really impressed. But you're right about that with the candidates. I mean, there's, you know, they're all going to say, well, these are my projects I'm going to work on. But it all depends on their relationship with, with the, the governor. governor. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you can't, you know, and uh, which is, uh, okay. So why do you think the carpenters are spending so much money for Josh Green? I've been wanting to ask somebody that, you know. This, this is a great question. $400,000, uh, I was told. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a ton. And then what are they, you know, so part of it, I think, is that they're, they're trying to, to punish Jill Takuda, I think. Oh, yeah? I mean, that's partly my, my take on this. Because that, of what have she done in the, in, but punishing Jill when you've got that many people running. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe they, I, I don't actually, I'll be honest, I don't fully understand. I mean, I've always thought that they were, you know, it's less that they were, for green, although I think they are, but that they're against other people. Well, they put out, um, they, they really put out for it. Yeah. And so it seems to have made a difference because uh, I, I would have assumed just by watching that debate that um, Cavaglio was pretty strong candidate. He was pretty strong. You know, it's interesting about Cavaglio because he, I think the polling has pretty, showed him pretty consistently in second, maybe third place, but always doing well. Well, yeah. And, um, you know, he's the only one with executive experience. You know, he came out, he was the first guy out there on the debate. And I thought he was really going to have a strong performance. It wasn't, it wasn't quite, quite, I don't think quite, it quite there. Did what he did. Uh, his campaign is actually, I mean, his slogan is pretty good. Think big, right? It's funny. It's sort of <laughs> endearing. He's a big former football player. But the problem with Carvalho is he hasn't had any money. He can't really get his message out. Yeah, so he that's, can't it's increase tough. his support. It's tough. Yeah. I, I ran for lieutenant governor, and, and there's no other office, maybe, maybe OHA, that has a harder time raising money than yeah. running for lieutenant governor. Because they don't have any independent power, right? No. Yeah. And, and, but I, I thought that uh, Coco did pretty well. I agree. I think, I think uh, Kim Coco, I mean, she's, a, she's an attorney. She's a you know, strong debater. She's coming you know, from, from the left, from the real progressive And she's angle. a very, I mean, you could, she was clearly progressive. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah and it was her, her politics was very clear. Absolutely. I mean, and she's, I mean, that's her whole history and her um, you know, programs she supported in the past and all of her LGBT activism. So she can really capture that group, and she's you know, articulate. I liked her response about, you know, what you know, what are you gonna do as lieutenant governor? And she said, I can work with anyone and I can work around anyone. I thought that was pretty clever. <laughs> yeah, it was clever yeah. because you know that's the that's the question. Yeah. The question always is, are we gonna have a divided executive? You yeah. Know, I, I remember uh, way back when uh, when a friend I forgot um, it, you know, the governor of California would have to rush back. Oh, Jer Jerry Brown, mm -hmm. he was governor of California. He used to have to rush back because he was afraid his lieutenant governor might sign a bill. You know, <laughs> so it would be at a meeting someplace. <laughs> cool back. I'm straight back. Well, so what, what's, your, what's your thoughts about the first congressional district? All right. So this, I mean, I, first, I don't think people at the debate had even really adjusted to the fact that, that Ed Case was in it all of a sudden. I, mean, I don't yeah. think they were really prepared for that. I mean, it's a, it's a really crowded field. Um, but the interesting thing to me about that race, when you think of how it compares nationally, um, is that with the exception of Coniella, who has his own set of liabilities, pretty much everyone is either a centrist or kind of a center-right Democrat. I mean, right. like Ed Case, right. Donna Mercado, they're more conservative. Um, even to some degree, Doug Chin, you know, from some of um, his earlier history. Right. So we don't, what we don't have here in Hawaii, which I know confuses a lot of people on the mainland, is you know, we don't, with the exception of Kaniella, we don't have this kind of move to the left like you've seen well, a lot of places move on to the, the left. Yeah, yeah. But you saw, I saw some, you know, it seemed to me like uh, there was a, with the exception of Case, yeah. although even he, uh, there was a kind of real play for the progressive vote. There was yeah. a kind of, um, you know, they're going after the, the, uh, the Sanders activists. Yeah. They... And I, I wouldn't have thought that about Case per se, except that one, some of his campaign workers were the same people who worked so hard for Sanders. And I, I thought for myself, this is really strange because, you know, he's a conservative yeah. Democrat. Yeah. He's not, wouldn't be well, running around with Bernie. Sure. You know? No, no, not at all. Uh, but but you're right about that. There's kind of a sense, I mean, they're, they're trying to play it very carefully. They're I trying think to they, play they, it right yeah, down they, the they, middle. They want to you know? get those progressive younger voters. They want to look like they understand their concerns and they're worried about young people. But they don't want to alienate the people who really do vote in the primary, the older 
uh, the older voters, kind of more mainstream Democrats. Yeah, somebody the, that you know will actually be voting. Yeah, the HGA know? crowd. Right. I mean, they're they're not they're not the Sanders So how folks. successful were they? Well, it was interesting to watch. Um, Kaniala go after Beth Fukumoto. It was. I mean, you know, there's, there's. It's not just politics with them. I think there's something personal. <laughs> <in this story. laughs> well, but, but, but what about Case and Donna? It was yeah, like that too. That was that was a little strange too, because the. Um, I mean, it it uh, it. Uh, so Donna. I mean, um, uh, they. Uh, you know, it really became this kind of strange personal fight with them. I mean, she attacked him for not showing up in Congress, and I think right. that was a way to get at him for running against Akaka, to bring it up indirectly. Um, yeah. And, and uh, he attacked her for being a career politician, which to me seemed a little strange because, you know, it's, yeah, it's I mean, not he's that he's like from a, outside. Exactly. Yeah, I didn't really I, I got to say, it. though, my opinion is that he, re he at least began his race very well planned, very yeah. strategic. He came in at the right time for somebody coming in, uh, you know, late. late, and it was timed in a way, and he, it, it, they lost no momentum. No. I mean, there was no pause between the announcement and the active campaigning. In fact, I, I saw him that night, and I said, you know, Ed, you, you're doing a, a, you're running a great campaign, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and he, he performed really well at the debate, too. Yeah, he did. I mean, he looked, he looked like he could step into the role right away, and well, I think that's, that's that, what that people was, wanted to that see. Well, that was his, uh, so, and, uh, and Donna, I thought, held her own with her particular base, you know? So we're looking at uh, an interesting pairing. You know, people sort of selected who they thought their yeah. competition was. And uh, what do you think about Ernie? Well, so I thought I thought that actually he was he was one of the the most entertaining people up there. Oh, it was I mean, great! He, I thought he made yeah, some I jokes. Did. He cracked, you know, he 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 made some jokes <laughs> with the moderators. I mean, he he really endeared himself. I don't know how much that's going to help him uh, win votes. No, I don't know, but he it, it was good to have it, somebody, you know. You know, and, and it's such a crowded race up there. It's not always such a bad strategy to just get yourself some attention. Maybe people say, "Oh, I'm going to check this guy out, learn a little more about him." I mean, he was memorable at least, which is, you know, one thing that sometimes that can oh, work. Oh, yeah, that, that'll yeah. That work uh, good for you. You know, it can, well, you know, um, and I know that uh, he has ambitions. So even if he doesn't win this, he, this may, may or may not help him. I don't know, but. He'll get his name out there yeah. more. I mean, he's had a, for someone who's been in the, the public spotlight as much as he has, I've been surprised at how how tough of a time he's had breaking into this race. I think that's the problem with being a chairman of the city council. Yeah. You know, you're always going to have to be in a position where there are equal number of people who don't like what you've done. That's right. You get a lot of negative healthy, attention. You know? Yeah. Um, but uh, any, uh, any prognosis? Well, look, we haven't seen a poll, although there's one that'll come out tomorrow from the Star Advertiser. Um, when case is in the race, and so I think the question is who he's really taking votes from. Is it, you know, is it from Donna Mercado Kim? Well, we'll come back yeah. and you can tell us what you who, yeah. who he is. <laughs> All right. All right. We're going to take a short break right now, and we'll be right back. And by the way, folks, we got the big stuff coming up: the governor's race, and of course, our president and his conduct in uh, Europe. <laughs> I'm getting older. Do I need to worry about falling? Yes, you do. Each year, one in four people 65 and older will experience a fall, and many will be serious. The majority of falls happen at home, so remove things that could make you trip and install handrails to keep you steady. To learn more about the steps you can take to help prevent a fall, please talk to your doctor. You can also visit aarpfoundation.org or medicaremadeclear.com slash falls. This message was brought to you by United Healthcare and AARP Foundation. When it comes to managing your pain, you have a choice. Don't mask your pain with opioids. Choose to treat it with the help of a physical therapist. Physical therapists treat pain through movement and exercise. No warning labels required, and you get to actively participate in your care. Choose to improve your health without the risks of opioids. Choose physical therapy. Welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe and our guest, Colin Moore. And if you want to ask my guest a question or myself, 
You can all call us on our hotline, which is 808-374-2014. 808-374-2014. Okay, we were just making some predictions. But before you get to the prediction, I'm going to ask you an academic question, which is, what percentage of the vote do you think one of these candidates would have to get in order to, to win? To win? Um, I mean... Because it's a plurality It's election. a plurality, right. So they just have to get the most, of, uh, of course. But... I think I think the winner of CD1 and and LG is probably going to be in the low 30s. Percent. Low 30s. Yeah. That's, you think they need to get that much? Oh, they don't need to get that much. That's just what I think. Yeah, you think get. the winner will yeah, get? Yeah, yeah. Low 30s. I think people will start cons more and more consolidating around a single candidate. So I think that'll push them up a little bit more. So I guess that's all to say. I don't think whoever wins. It'll be it'll be a squeaker. I think it's probably going to be. I mean, somebody's going to a pretty some... solid victory in the low 30s. Okay, yeah. okay. So, um, what's your prognosis? All right. Oh well, before we get <laughs> yeah, there, Doug Chin. Doug Chin. All right. Oh, how did he do? So Doug Chin did okay at the debate. I mean, the thing about Doug Chin that a lot of people may not know is he's actually never run for anything before. This is his first campaign, and I think you can see a little bit of the inexperience. Um, I think he made a real mistake in, in the race. They all had a chance to ask another candidate a question, as you probably remember. Right. And he asked sort of this, you know, kumbaya question. I mean, can we all agree to support the winner of the race? I thought that was a real mistake. I think, yeah, you know, yeah. in this particular race, you've got to look like you're tough. Yeah. Um, and that does mean being a little confrontational. Well, especially because the Democrats got to go to yeah, Washington and exactly, face, and face Trump. Trump. Right. Um, and he has a good track record there, but I don't think he really capitalized um, on it. I mean, he needed to really come out strong um, when he, you know, was in the, the news all of the time because of Trump v. Hawaii. And I think he lost some momentum. And then when Case got in, I think, you know, well, we'll see, but I think Case is going to take some votes from him. Mm. Okay. Winner? All right. So, um, you know, for, for, for CD1, I'm going to say Ed Case. Um, oh. And the reason is, look, he just has so much name recognition. If this weren't such a crowded field, that might be more difficult. Right. Um, but because it is, because he doesn't have to get that, you know, a huge percentage of the vote, um, I think people are really going to just go for somebody they know, um, you know, somebody they, they sort of trust, someone who looks like he can start working on day one. I think, I think that's probably the answer. I mean, people say we need a fresh voice, but given who pretends to vote in primary elections, you know, it's an older, slightly more conservative group. You I think, think Ed Case? I think it's going to be Ed Case. And what about Donna? You know, I think that, that Donna's performed strongly. The thing about her is that she has, she's always struggled with kind of her, her unfavorability, right? Oh, yes. She has some core supporters, but there's a lot of people who don't like her, um, you know, because, you know, she has this track record of being this hard-charging legislator, the person who drags bureaucrats in front of her. But, you know, you create some enemies there, too. And I think it's, I think she kind of has a ceiling on her support that's going to be tough to, tough to get so above. let's go to the biggie. All right. There's a governor's There's race. There's a governor's, governor's race. race. We haven't talked about this uh, yet. Okay, so we, we, we'll begin <laughs> the same way. Let's yeah. talk about the debate. All right. So I thought David Ige did well at this debate. I mean, there are a couple yeah. of rough moments, like when he shuffled through his index cards looking for a yeah, question. Yeah, looking for a question. That wasn't great. But, you know, the thing about David Ige is he's really I mean, he's really improved a lot over time. I mean, he comes across knowledgeable. Um, and so, you know, and, and frankly, you know, standards tend to be a little low because they know he's not a strong public speaker. And so he just has to do OK to be thought of as doing well. And I thought he, I thought he was pretty solid at that debate. Well, there's an advantage that an incumbent governor especially has. That's right. And that is that they know what's going on. I yeah. mean, they're working with it every day. It's their job. Yeah, they're really, they, they understand all the state-level issues. And plus, look, there's a lot of the fundamentals point in his direction. Generally, we have a strong economy, low unemployment. I mean, things like that should, should help him. So now, when you look at uh, today, there was a poll. Yeah. Recently, just came out. And um, and so over time, it looked like he was way behind. Oh, yeah. And it looked like he was a little behind. And now all of a sudden, it looks like he's ahead. So I'm not going to throw you the curve. I'm going to throw you a curve instead all of right. a fastball. <laughs> and that is that, do you think the advertiser polls are... Accurate? Accurate? Well, look, it, it, I don't have any reason to think that they're... I mean, their, their poll is, is wrong, I mean, in the kind of a, a fundamental way. But, you know, the other thing to think about is they have the same company who did their polling back in March, I mean, using the same statistical right. models to generate their, 
their assumptions and get the results. And you know, in, that's it's the change, right? And even in their own poll, doing it the same even way. Even if they, they do it the same way, there's some validity to yeah, change. Yeah, because you can look at the change, and he, there's a 24 point change. That is remarkable. Yeah, I mean, that's that is an really incredible amazing. comeback. Now, that's not to say he's he, you know he's got it all locked up because. No, nobody he, does. No, nobody does. And right. I'm sure we're going to see the Hanabusa campaign hit back pretty hard. And, and as you know, she has the support of the same Carpenter Super PAC that's been helping Josh Green. Well, you know, it's sort of interesting because the, they have been um, very uh, positive, actually, with whatever ads they have run mm -hmm. thus far, mostly with Josh Green. Yeah. But um, and, and the Hanabusa campaign. Uh, Started negative ads. Yeah, you know, probably for Washington D.C. This may not be soft, negative, but for Hawaii, it's pretty. But for yeah. Hawaii, it's pretty. Yeah. You know, it's like noticeable. Yeah, and I, you know, the usual strategy is let your surrogates do that sort of thing. And uh, but the campaign itself is 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 coming out front and center. So, you know, I I don't know what the uh, strategy might be. Do you have any thoughts? Well, it's, I mean, so first we have to remember, right, it's, it, you know, they have to play a careful game here because it's illegal for them to coordinate. They can't actually talk to right. each other. So they're, they're probably trying to guess what the other side is doing. My guess is that you're right. My guess is we're going to see the Hanabusa campaign emphasize her, her virtues. They're going to talk a lot about leadership and probably ignore Ige, and they're going to let the Carpenters do well, they sh That's the normal the, Yeah, process. do the real dirty business. But, but you're right, I saw some Hanabusa campaign it's funded not, ads that were Talking about the yeah, false missile it, alert, and I was surprised about that. You know, it's sort of, uh, sort of not the usual mode. They, I, I had heard, and this is not, this didn't come from the carpenters, but it came from the other union, that there was a sort of a, an informal pack mm -hmm. that they weren't going to get negative this time. Really? No matter which side of the fence they were on. Oh. Only because they didn't want to offend. Right, whoever wins. Whoever won. And uh, whereas, and so I asked the, the particular union about, well, what did that have to do, you know, like uh, same situation existed when the governor's, I mean, the mayor's race was in, uh, being held and Ben Caetano was running. And they said, well, that was different. That was life or death, I mean, for the project. Oh, for the project, I see. But for this thing. So I, I don't know. It's, so, it's just sort of... This whole election just doesn't seem to fit any kind of uh, normal progression. No, and and for Ige to, to make this, I mean, you know, there's plenty of governors who who've come back in this way, but it, I mean, even still, it's pretty remarkable. I mm. think, I mean, I think part of it is is that he you know, he's sort of been given a gift because the Hanabusa campaign hasn't been very strong. I mean, you know, they, you have to give people a reason to vote for you. Right. Right. And they, we're not talking about ideological differences. We're not really talking about major policy differences. I mean, maybe HGA thinks they can get a better deal from Hanabusa, but that's small stuff. I mean, but really, But HGA it's, has now committed itself to uh, arbitration. Yeah, yeah, you're so right. So what, you, you yeah. what do you need any, any, any more? either one of yeah, them for? Exactly. You know? Exa I thought they might stay out of the thing altogether, but, right. they, but they didn't. So... It, um, it, it, you're right, it's, it's, it's strange. Um, and then now, we, well, what do you think of today's poll about who trusts who more? So this, I mean, this was bad news for Hanabusa, right? Because the, you know, I think the, the thing about Ige is that people like him, people think he's trustworthy. You know, the question is, is he up for the job? But in this poll, you know, we expected Hanabusa at least to do pretty well in leadership. That's what and, our whole campaign she, is she about. And she didn't. And she know? didn't. So that would, I mean, if I was the campaign, I'd be really concerned because if that's your message, it's clearly not getting across to voters. Well, that's why I asked my first question, which is, uh, you know, uh, how valid are the advertiser polls? I mean, in my particular case, they had me losing by 20 points, right. you know, and I ended up getting elected, much to my... Surprise. <laughs> well, we're glad you got elected. <laughs> no, considering the poll. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and so th these are such interesting um, phenomena. I was also interested in the, the uh, perceptions held by Republicans in Hawaii. Yeah. I can't believe it. I mean, here, this is even... At least it used to be. Even Republicans in Hawaii were pretty progressive. Yeah. I mean, you know, Pat Psyche. Yeah. Former congresswoman. Sure. Woman, she was. I mean, you couldn't find a person more pro Hawaii. Yeah. I mean, and 
Oh, if you thought Danny Noy was after a few, you know, uh, what do you call those things? Uh, pork barrel. Right. Uh, I mean, you ought to see Pat, <laughs> Pat, you know, because she knew that this went to, you know, help her people. And, um, and yet, all of a sudden, Donald Trump. There's tremendous support for him. For yeah. Republicans. It's yeah. like 90% of the oh, Republicans yeah. in Hawaii thinks that he's doing a good job. And you got to ask yourself, who are these Republicans? Yeah. You know? They're not, they're, not the few Republic, the Republican friends I have. You know, there's a bunch of interesting studies that have come out recently that suggests that, you know, we always say all politics is local, right? Yeah. It's that really politics is becoming more and more national. That sense, that polarization is just washing everything out. Well, that's, you know, that's sort of, that's really interesting. I think I saw the same article, and it basically the premise was that uh, the whole country is getting divided. It's also yeah. kind of age. Right. The age of, uh, the young people seem to hang on to more, uh, national politics than than local, older, yeah, and 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 the older people because I mean one of the indi indicators of, of that is the idea that uh, well like the race in uh, New York right in the Queens. Democrats yeah. in Queens right the Democrats are supposed to be pulling together so we can win races right and yet we're putting people in office that are so far to the left that we are actually going to end up having something that looks like a right-left uh, race. Exactly. And that's also, well, the Democratic Party in California didn't... Uh, Support Feinstein. Feinstein. No, it's remarkable. I mean, how do you deal with these? But, but my, I mean, maybe you have some insights on this. My question is, we haven't seen that happen here. I mean, this is still a pretty centrist Democratic Party. I mean, you have candidates yeah. like Caniella, but... For the most part, you don't really see well, that like for you the do most in California. Part, but it may be the reason why the Republican Party in Hawaii, maybe they went too far national too mm -hmm. quick, you know? Which brings us to our favorite person, Donald Trump. I've got to get this <laughs> yeah. question. It, was it treason or was it not, in your opinion, when he stands next to Putin and blames our uh, sides with the KGB instead of the CIA? You know, it's, it's pretty close. I mean, this is an extraordinary moment in American history. I can't imagine any other president standing up there next to the president of Russia and and, ma and 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 making excuses so, for him and blaming the FBI, blaming the CIA, and, and blaming the country. Yeah, saying it's our fault, fault that we're not friends with Russia. And I think back, and I was thinking, it wasn't that long ago when Russians were persecuting anybody who was at all yeah. religious? It didn't matter what your religion was. And at the same time, blaming our, our core European allies, the British, the Germans, everybody else. And, you know, I think that's the thing. Even if you don't, you know, no matter what you think about Donald Trump, the really concerning thing is he's doing tremendous and sometimes irreversible damage to this post-war American order. All of these international institutions that Americans built— Right. He is, he's destroying. Yeah, and, and, you know, bringing that home and to see people say, you know, I, today I, I, I asked a number of people what they thought about Donald Trump's uh, behavior. And there was like, oh, well, you know, more of the same, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And I said, well, you know, he did this in Europe. They said, yeah, but I kind of like the idea that he's... Uh, Making them pay. Yeah, and I and I thought to myself, this is this is so not what I was ever thought about America. You know, I agree. But you know, that's the thing that I think for a lot of people who watch politics, it's so extraordinary. Is his support is still pretty strong. People, you know, we a lot of people, including me, find some of his actions offensive, but it doesn't seem to hurt him that much. I mean, he's he mm -hmm. continues to do well, and that's why the Republicans. How much of it is just him. the white noise? You know, there's so much of it that you just. You know, you just keep hoping that something will exactly and take this, it away. And, and given our, you know, incredible media environment right now, I mean, so much information, he 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 can still manage everything. I mean, well, his tweets, you know, that's what everyone's talking about. He's well, in everyone's I, I have um, I have a, a test for leadership, for democratic leadership. Maybe maybe our all of our candidates who are at the super. A debate will take it up, and that's I think it's time for local local leaders to stand up in their states and say, "We are not going to put up with this kind of nonsense." At least not in not not in Hawaii, yeah, and uh, not elsewhere. It's uh, and the model for doing that kind of activism would actually be the um, 
the Paris Accords, you mm -hmm. know, for, for the environment, where the state says, I don't care, Donald, exactly. you do what you like, but we're going to do something else. And I think there's been a little of that blue state federalism, and I, I hope we'll see more. I mean, Hawaii certainly has played its, its part in that. And I think that we ought to encourage it. Yeah. Anyway, thank you very, very much for joining me. My pleasure. I've had some fun, and I look forward to... Uh, what, are you going to do any more commentary? Yeah, I think so. I'm certainly on, on election night. So oh, terrific. Maybe you'll be there, too. So. Uh, I don't know. But anyway, I look forward to hearing. All right. Thanks, Carl. Thank you, everybody. Join us again.